Hello, Cheeky Natives! Happy Balaza, happy Balaza! This is quite a special podcast since we are recording it on Valentine's Day. So, happy Valentine's Day, Latokonolo. How are you? How is your happy, Balaza? Happy, 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 happy. Thank you. Now, I will wait till my Valentine's gave Give me a dress, ne? Dr. Slay. So, today I put it on. Can you hot? Yeah. Happy, happy, my dear, happy. And we have a very special guest who is just the right person for Valaza, for Valentine's Day, for the Day of Love. And you know what? I don't know if you guys are ready, right? So I have the supreme pleasure of introducing today Angela Makola, who is our special Valentine's Day podcast guest. She lives and works in Johannesburg. The Read Dance Stalker is the highly anticipated sequel to her debut novel, Red Ink. And it was followed by entertaining escapades and sexual misadventures of modern women in 30th Candle. Her third novel was Black Widow's Society, then marked a return to a thrilling crime-ridden world. Then there were the bestsellers, Blessed Girl and Critical But Stable, characterized by Makola's trademark dark humor and astute commentary. She also now has the adaptation of Red Ink, which is on show max and is absolutely brilliant. Like, two episodes in and I'm just like girl are you ready to be an award-winning spring sambo like <laughs> so welcome to the cheeky natives Angela welcome to thank you. Welcome what to a you. rousing welcome thank you so much uh you've just energized me I'm coming from traffic like a long day of sitting in traffic don't ask me why but I'm I'm happy to be here I'm surprised that I'm a fitting guest for valentine's day because i'm always killing people in my books <laughs> well look, <laughs> we will talk about that be a perfect guest for valentine's day guys <laughs> but they find love and they have great sex in your books so. yeah they know that they do that they but do i must killing people. Mm-hmm. Angela, about you. but anyways so angela <laughs> red ink is your first novel right and we now know that Red ink is also adapted into a television series Tell us all about that. How do you feel that from book to screen, man? From book to screen, how does that feel? Oh, Tony, like, I don't know. You know, the, you know I've had um, an initial experience of uh, adapting a book of mine to screen. And it was so different going through this process with Red Ink because, number one, I had the absolute dream that all authors, I think, or most authors have of being directly involved in um, the adaptation from development right down to production and post-production. So I just really feel so blessed. I can't, I cannot express enough how grateful I am that I was such a pivotal part of this process. I mean, I sold the the show to to show mix myself. And so I wanted to make sure that I was involved. And I can tell you that the experience has been completely different from the initial experience. And I just wish this, I really wish that as many authors as possible who do get their books adapted. I mean, not everybody would want to be involved as an executive producer and get through all of that other stuff that's involved in production. But definitely my wish for for other authors that get adaptations is that they are at least in the writer's room. They have opinions or at least they have some influence in how the work is adapted. And I can tell you, I mean, it's still two episodes in. But already from the reaction of viewers and readers of my work, there's been such a positive reaction. It's so incredible. And I think that is the difference. I think that is the difference. I'm curious about the creative process, right? Because we always think about page to screen. And I think there's a very big divide. I think lovers of the book will hold on to the book, sometimes in ways that are unhealthy. But I can imagine how much more that must be for you as the author, right? Because you wrote the book and that's that's inevitably like your baby. So I'm curious about the creative process, but also the act of of surrender, right? So knowing what to let go and what to hold on to as part of the creative process in having a page to screen adaptation. What a great question. I mean, it, it's not easy. It will never be easy because... Firstly, you have to surrender to the fact that you're not a television writer. So yes, I was a producer. Yes, I sold and pitched the concept, 
but I'm not a TV writer. I've never written for television before. And of course, I wanted this to be a, a high quality production from development right to post-production. And so the act of surrender starts right there where you have to understand that. I mean, a lot of people were saying to me, oh, of course, people close to me, they're like, oh, you're so brilliant. You have to be the head writer. And I, I said to them, there's no way I can be the head writer in this thing. I will rather I would rather appoint a head writer that I trust who I would work with to bring the work to, to screen. So I think it's also very healthy to establish those boundaries for yourself as well as a novelist. Because if you, I feel that if I had been stubborn and wanted to, you know, drive the story myself, we would have ended up with a production that may not have been as amazing as this. So I feel like television people understand television, novelists understand textual writing. And so I'm very happy that I, I worked with not, not just Andy Peterson, who, who ended up being my head writer, but I, I worked with a number of head writers. And just to show you how difficult the process is and how difficult it is to just hit that sweet spot the reason I had so many different writers come onto the process and come off the process is because I'm in the room and there's expectations also from channel. There's expectations from me. And sometimes we're not going to see eye to eye. And so it was not easy to get to that perfect balance of being true to the mechanics of what television writing requires and staying true to the story and I feel that what we have now is that kind of perfect marriage my readers may not 100% agree with some of the decisions that I've made and I understand that and I also was not 100% sometimes I butted heads with channel butted heads with a uh, head writer but I feel like in the end we have the perfect compromise in terms of story, because I feel like we were able to keep you glued to screen from episode one to episode eight, which is important. And so some of the things that maybe I wanted to fight for, if we had stuck to them, maybe we could have had a bit of a dragging of a story. Some of the changes that we made, for instance, the most obvious one is that Detective Morabedi is a man in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and to Lisa Honolo's great pleasure, <laughs> we made we made him into a woman. And like I, I think we can take the storyline right up to Rita Stalker, right up to what happens between Morapeli and Lucy. We can just take it to the top floor <laughs> with the female detective now, who is incredibly, incredibly captivated or captured by Losha Cooper. She's an amazing actress, and I think she. She kills the role. And I was happy when we had our first, first writer's room and we're discussing her, her gender. And I think the first head writer, it was Zeli. She was like, I think she should be a female. And then we talked about it. And immediately I was like, you know what? You saw these two women, South African women, you know, who are going to have to somehow work together to get to the bottom of you know, putting this man where he belongs, though really behind bars, but getting behind the crime, other dark force that's out there in the world that's linked to Napoleon. I liked the idea of it being two women joining forces to bring down like forces of evil. So the feminist in me was definitely like an immediate, like said an immediate yes to that. So yes, there have been changes. Some readers might not be happy with them, but I think that a lot of the changes we made in the end benefits the story greatly. I mean, now you, I am ready. I am ready for Losha and I, I, I'm I, ready for Murabedi and Lucy, I'm ready. Are there any, I mean, this is kind of an unfair question, but I mean, a Chicky Natives kind of exclusive. Are there any other books that we'll be seeing on screen? Is there more of book to screen coming from Angela? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a very thorny question for me right now because, you know, I'm unfortunately very honest, maybe too honest for my own good. So, you know, The 30th Candle, we know it was uh, adapted uh, to screen as a feature length and it was uh, streamed on Netflix. I wasn't too happy with that, not with the production. And um, I've, we've, I've adapted working with Bond Productions and then Critical But Stable is also, so I have a company called Bryce 
Park Films. So it's our property. So we have the rights to it. it. It has been commissioned, but there's also kind of some challenges there that I can't really get into, having to do with something that feels like a copycat production of the work. So, and then we have Black Widow Society has a production company that is working on adapting it. It's already in development. The Blessed Girl is in development with a an independent producer. And so I think that makes all of, that makes all the books that bar makes- one, which is, the Very- Redance, yeah, except the Redance Stalker, which is a sequel to Red Ink. So yeah, yeah. Hashtag Sivenza, girl. Hashtag Sivenza. That's all we're hearing. That's all we're hearing. Yes. So I actually want to get into Read Dawn Stalker because I have so many feelings about this book, Angela. So I hope you are ready. So my first, I guess the, the first question is around writing a sequel. I think sequels are, are tricky, right? It's particularly writing a sequel to a book that was so well received and so beloved, right? I know I harassed you for years around writing a follow-up because I just couldn't believe that she left where you left it, right? And I guess that's testament to having written a great book because that we were all so attached to it. But because so many of us were so attached to this the, the first book, Red Ink, I think that there was a little bit of a pressure, right? So I'm curious about why you chose to write the sequel at the time that you did. Like, what about this time felt right in ways that it hadn't before? As you know, I think as as you know, readers of my work know in my back history that re- the red ink is a little bit autobiographical, but it's a difficult experience and it's a difficult story. And there have been difficulties in my life after I wrote it. And so the young woman that I was when I wrote the story has gone through a lot in life, uh, many transitions. And, and obviously I'm not the same girl that I was at the time. So, you know, when people were saying, oh, when is the sequel? When is the sequel? I just knew that I wasn't ready because it felt like stepping back in time into who I was. And also, I guess there was that reluctance to kind of revisit some of the experiences that I've undergone as a, as a mom, as a woman, as a career woman, as a journalist, even as a PR person. So I knew that like it would never, I would never write it until I'm comfortable enough to have processed what I needed to process in my life, like passwords and things like that. I needed to be in an emotionally kind of free or I needed to be in a kind of an emotional reprieve to know that I would be ready to, you know, set foot back into that world and that life. And I guess in some ways also even writing the screenplay, because obviously, like I said, I was involved in the in developing the screenplay. It was a similar kind of process. And so when I had to go back to Lisa's stomping grounds uh, in the adaptation of the series, it freed me to realize that yes, emotionally, I think I am finally ready. But I think what was a true gift is that because television writing is such a collaborative process, it's group work, it's, you know, so we started off right from the bed with two other TV writers when we were just preparing the pitch deck, you know, to send to streamers. So already kind of the emotional load was taken off my shoulders. And also when we're sitting there in the writer's room and people are talking about Napoleon, they're talking about Lucy in the third person, it kind of detached me as well. Like it it released me from holding on so much to the character as, you know, Angela 102 <laughs> or 2.0. <laughs> you know, Lucy didn't have to be Angela 2.0. She could be just another entity that's kind of separate from me because now I'm hearing people coming up with ideas, coming up with all sorts of crazy things that are going to happen to her. And I'm there in the room, I'm participating. And it felt like, okay, like this it ain't that deep, you know, like it's, it's something I can share. I can share this trauma with other people. Uh, so it was a great release um, process, that collaborative process. Mm-hmm. And I think it freed me to now go back to that character in an intimate way where it's just me and Lucy now as a novelist and, 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 you know, going back to her world. 
Yep. Did reading Read John Stalker change the way that you appreciated Red Ink, right? So you've spoken about having to revisit it and come back as an author, right? Outside of, you know, it maybe being an extension of yourself. But having now written Read John Stalker and then having to reread Red Ink, did it change your appreciation for for how you wrote it and what you did with that book? Did it change your perspective on some things as well? You know, one of the things that I've really struggled with, both in the television and in writing the sequel, is actually really, really going back to red ink. I, I, I tend to scan because it just gets, it, it, it's jarring, right? And also the way I was writing, it was just so, it was wild. Like, I really just would go wherever, where angels fear to tread. And I feel like I am a little bit more conscious now I think I'm more conscious about things like triggers you know because I know that so many women have gone through sexual violation and you know I know that I tend to be very graphic in my descriptions uh, I feel that in red ink I was much much more graphic than I am now now I do try to approach those scenes with a bit of sensitivity. I don't know if readers picked it up or they're like, oh gosh, she's still as violent as ever. But I do try to be more sensitive to how women's bodies are violated. In this book, you know, I think the most violent acts are more between the men in the book, you know, you know, the hunter versus, you know, the prey and all of that kind of stuff. So I think I was trying to tread a little bit softer with Read and Stock. At least I picked up that that's what you're trying to do, right? But also I think what I picked up was it felt like, you know, on screen, off screen type of thing when you think about television language. So kind of the violation that would have happened to these women happened kind of off screen, right? So you don't go into the graphic detail. You you kind of, yeah. it's in the domain you, of- You see the, the scene of the crime, like the aftermath <laughs> more than the actual so I, I thought that was uh, very beautiful. I'm glad that you picked that up because, you know, I mean, even with the television adaptation, you if you've watched the first episode, you'll see that we were so sensitive. And I did mention, I think in a previous uh, interview that, Still, you know, people, actors are, are human beings and you do find that maybe an actress has been violated before. And as much as you try to be sensitive, you know, th th there was one or two incidents where even after all those negotiations of how we're going to shoot the scene and how we're going to try and be as sensitive about it as possible because we know we don't want to re-traumatize victims because also I feel like the series especially is an end redone stalker are uh, a dedication to victims of femicide of sexual assault and so if we are you know paying ode to people who have suffered you know in these kind of acts because it's such a, a horrifically south african thing that women often have to live in fear i think I'm getting a bit emotional so yes i think it was it was a lot about that and i would really appreciate it I, I mean, you don't know, you try what you can as a writer, but obviously just hearing it from people kind of is gratifying because I mean, you're trying to do something. Yeah, I think that's actually a good segue to think about, you know, a conversation we've had about writing about violence, right? In a country like ours, you know, you've spoken about triggering, but writing about violence in a country like ours, also knowing that you are a, a part of a group of people who who are you know vulnerable right who are vulnerable to all kinds of violence at different points in, in in our lives and I think about your decision to write about people like Napoleon right and thinking about how you ensure you know we've spoken about writing on screen off screen etc but how do you ensure that you don't minimize the impact I think you know People can be a little bit desensitized to crime just because of the kind of country and the space that we live in. And I think with the rise of, of genres like true crime, there's almost like a thing where people become removed from the reality of those crimes, right? So you're fascinated in the story almost as though there aren't real people behind this that have been affected by these crimes. And so I'm curious about now, how do you make the decision about writing about people, particularly like Napoleon, right? And how you ensure that you... Don't, the, the, the violence is gratuitous, but also that you don't minimize its impact. 
I mean, I think it's a very important decision, you know, writing about crime is an important decision for me as a woman and as a writer. I always talk about how as a society, we South Africans tend to not diagnose our problems. We brush over them. We we quite flip. I mean, you know, it's not intentional, the flippancy, but I do feel like we are a bit flippant about the monstrous things that are staring us in the face. I feel you can't, as a society, just continue in this kind of cycle of violence. I mean, our crime statistics for violent crime specifically, they're not abating, like they're actually getting worse. And I feel that that's where, you know, crime, true crime or crime fiction, especially crime fiction, that's where we sit, like that's the role that potentially we could play in society. The reason I'm saying that is because, you know, already the conversation, I mean, I mean, it's social media, so obviously it's not gonna be so analytical and in depth, but I've already seen people saying, hey, you know, you meet somebody, you're charmed and then Ganti, <laughs> that's gonna be like your last day. And we're so easily, we so easily get into people's cars thinking, oh, this could be my lover for life. And how many women have actually met their fate that way, where they're thinking, sometimes it's not immediate, like you have with the butcher, for instance, in Red Ink. Sometimes it's a relationship that you settle into. And then next thing you see your partner, your beloved, your Prince Charming, now turning you into a punching bag. And a lot of times you end up dead at the hands of your intimate partner. So these are the tough questions that I feel, you know, this kind of storytelling opens up a platform for us to discuss. The reason I'm saying that is firstly with writing, with, with, with story, you really get immersed into the character's lived experiences. So if it's the victim, we get to know who is she, what are her aspirations? You know, why did she say yes to that? lifts you know so it's different from an article where we're like oh gosh these girls are so stupid my big app you know you get to understand that the way that this person was approached the phase that they were in it's valentine's day can you imagine how, how vulnerable women are today like everybody's looking for love you're wearing your nice little red dress and there's mr handsome stopping you and propositioning you and he looks amazing he says the right things you're completely off your guard. And by the time you wake up to the realization that this is not the person that you thought you had fallen in love with or were attracted to, you're too far, you're in too deep, or you know, or you don't even have time to get to know them that well. And I, but I'm not saying that all South African men are going to put you in a body bag, uh, but I am saying that it humanizes the victims because a lot of times we judgmental of them or we read and we feel bad for for those 10 minutes then we move on with our lives so these stories kind of locate that kind of pain and it layers the 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 context in which these things happen so that we're not dismissive of them and we also kind of can start having conversations about like how do we court i mean what is courtship in, in 2024? Knowing that sometimes things might not turn out the way that you hope they will. What do I need to be cautious about as a woman? You know, maybe I just need to have like a, a an app that tells my friend where I am so that if Mr. Charming turns into Mr. Horrific, <laughs> I've got an out, you know? Um, so it's little things like that that actually do, that can change, that can save a life. It's little, little things. But if we just carry on, we don't even have time to, to probe, like I said, like probe our behaviors and, and probe the behaviors of the perpetrator as well. You know, if we raise kids in a place where we're always screaming at them, we're always telling them what bastards they are, how horrible and hopeless they are, how men are hopeless, how all South African men are just violent and there's no future, there's no prospect. That kind of messaging, you know, I will irritate. They, they, they thrived from that kind of messaging because some men feel like like they hate us anyway. So like, you know, what else am I going to do? Let's just 
show these women where they belong. So issues of misogyny, of emasculation as well, and all of that kind of stuff. We need to open up the conversation and we may need to make the conversation accessible for both parties, for both, you know, potential victims and for, you know, people who are just boiling inside. They're like a, a ticking time bomb and they don't have a space to vent what exactly is, you know, putting them on edge. So so I I hope, I know it sounds lofty, I hope, even if, you know, it gets through to just a few people, I hope that it can create a space for those kind of difficult conversations. You spoke a little bit about loneliness, right? And particularly like kind of these days, right? And I was interested in what really happens is that I feel social media really plays a pivotal role, right? But also kind of this ease of having access to people's lives, right? So whether it be curiosity, but we know in this instance how Napoleon is able to prey on women, right? How he's able to kind of lure them in and all of that, right? I wanted to find out the way in which we're saying, right, whether it was a warning to be careful about who we kind of also connect with on social media, right? But also... Alongside that conversation, like the role of loneliness and how accessible social media and somewhat intimacy can be in social media, I, I felt like that was kind of a commentary that you were making within the book that like the two sides of this coin is that you do find people who are lonely, but you also find people who are monstrous and use kind of this space in order to feed their curiosity and lure people in. That's the paradox, I think, of what social media has done, you know, for our society, especially for like Gen Zs and millennials, you know, people who've grown up in this digital age, that the world has never been so accessible and so open, yet the world has never been so solitary and, and isolated, you know? And I think the danger of that is that you tend to find comfort in, communicating to these faceless people but but in their facelessness there's a lot of common common ground I mean like you're not gonna have you know long-term conversations online conversation with somebody that you have nothing in common with of course there's gonna be something that just clicks that you know continuously takes you back to that person and there's resonance and there's beauty and there's all of that so so that is the paradox because that's what Napoleon you know being an ex-inmate and now finding himself in in this world he's always never had he's never found it easy to connect with people but like the way that this social media this world of social networks online is structured is perfect for somebody like him because you know he can draw you in which is his skill as much as you know when you see him on the street you may not be like hey loputilona according to off you know so online you can't you can, those little <laughs> social cues, those little social cues that are almost subconscious for us, you know, it, there's, a, there's like there's a sub, subconscious kind of instinct that will tell you, I look with Ilona, he sounds okay, okay, he's driving a car, whether a nice car, whatever, but yeah, I, I'm not comfortable. You don't have that online. He can put, he can catfish by putting little Honolulu's picture. And he looks affable. He looks he looks like a lawyer. <laughs> and you're like, I know I'm Temba, Lowe's Tandra Sam's good going. Uh, <laughs> and yes, so it was it was that commentary. And also just how I think, especially when social media kind of first blew up, like how careless we were. I mean, like you would post your location, like you would post, like you'd leave location A and say, what was that Facebook thing that it would show? it would show that you've moved from this place to that place and this place to that place. I mean, Instagram still does that, but I mean, come on, you, you I mean, know. Checking in everywhere. Yes. Checking in. I've even forgotten because I, I, I tried to stop checking in. <laughs> yeah. People were checking in everywhere. So if I'm stalking you, I mean, I don't even need to do anything. I just need to log into Facebook or Instagram and I can follow you everywhere and I will know and I can I get to know your habits, I get to know your friends. So it's so easy for me to even pretend that I know you more than I do because I can say, hey man, no, no, no. Alma said I'm gonna find you here. You know, we're good people. And 
Alma said, well, we can have drinks and hang. And Alma's people are my people and all of that kind of stuff. So yes, it, it, is, it is that paradox, but, but we do have to be cautious. Unfortunately, we do have to be smart. Yes, we're lonely. Yes, we love connection. Yes, all of us want to connect. Yes, we our social skills, because of the fact that we live in this digital world, are not becoming as sophisticated as, as you know, pre-digital age, because there, that was the only way to meet people, was to meet them outside. But at the same time, caution is important. Right? Now, I want to talk about Lucy. <laughs> oh, Lucy. <laughs> Go for it. Lucy, my girl. Lucy, my girl. Lucy is such an interesting character, guys. Like, Lucy has complex PTSD, right? And you understand why when you've read Red Ink, you understand why Lucy would have complex PTSD. And I'm and now just you'd have watched Red Ink so you'll know for real why Lucy has complex PTSD. So you'll know for real why Mdanabantu is goishing the way she's goishing. And like, I'm just curious about a few things. So the one is like, her mental health, right? Because we see her encounter this complex PTSD in a society that almost shames her for just not being able to get it together and move past this this thing. But we know that many South Africans have complex PTSD. Many South Africans experience trauma and traumatic events happen to them, right? So it's an interesting choice for Lucy to experience complex PTSD. But also then there's the love story with Betty that, that ties into this, right? And there's an evolution that that love story does, which I find particularly interesting. And I'm trying to tie the two together because Lucy is like in the midst of umgoa.com. But there's also this love story that's evolving with Rapid that's that's interesting for both of them to experience. Yeah, I mean, knowing Lucy, the girl that she is, the world that she comes from, her ambitions, like she's a go-getter, you know, I think it it it's kind of unexpected. A lot of people are like, how? Oh, oh, Lucy, the points are very <laughs> like they say it outright. It's like, okay, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and uh, in the context of what you're talking about with regards to her PTSD, I mean, firstly, she's she tells herself that she is completely, you know, disinterested in, in romantic relationships because of what happened to her lover. Um, and, you know, she kind of tries to avoid dealing with her trauma by focusing all her attention on her on her child on her son and on her work and that's it you know that is that is her world that she resolves is going to define how she moves on from the trauma that she experienced and i suppose her, her gravitating towards morabedi is that sense of a shared trauma number one I mean Morabini was there when she was going through all the things that she went through and because a lot of the trauma that she experienced has to do with violence I suppose somebody like Morabini also kind of poses that kind of security blanket Yoguti you know even if I may find myself in similar encounters and of course she is a, a, a complex woman and almost a strange woman in the sense that she is drawn to danger. I mean, I don't think we should make any bones about the fact that she is somebody who is kind of like an adrenaline junkie in mm -hmm. that she constantly puts herself in situations that may not necessarily end well for her. Uh, but it's her drive to not come across as fearful like I think her her biggest pet peeve if I can put it that way is like being seen or or appearing to be fearful of all these dangers that are specifically unique to being a woman in the society so how she counters that is by going straight to where the danger is and she can't help it. Like she just, she just cannot help it. She's just drawn to going to where the danger is. And and it, again, it's another paradox in that she is such a caring mother. She's a loving mother. She will, you know, go to the ends of the world for her child. But I suppose, you know, there's also the question of why don't you just relax, mama? You know, just be like a nice little housewife or something. More relaxing, because 
you don't want to endanger, you know, those that you love. So I think there's kind of this warrior in her that just cannot let go of that need to fight, to fight back. And, and obviously she's not a physically strong person. So she uses the tools that uh, are in her armor, which is her journalistic wits, curiosity. She has the wherewithal to know or would you, if I if I call this person or if I try this or if I reach out to this, I'm sure you know I'll be able to to protect myself or to get to a point where I have a semblance of of safety. And I think that that all of that kind of informs why I, at this particular point in her life she would gravitate towards like a emora baby. Yeah, what's really interesting is is kind of this being drawn to danger, right? We know that Lucy is someone who basically runs towards danger head first, right? As your mother would say. Agana? Agana, peace. Agana, peace. Agana, peace. Agana, peace. But what was really fascinating... <laughs> what was really fascinating for me is like the one instance in which she wasn't seeking out danger, danger finds her, right? And danger finds her in like... That scary way right because we we see that she's like now okay I'm doing this wonderful job it's the 2010 world cup I need to get my ducks in a row everything and then here comes this copycat who is like okay baby I'm about to make your life interesting because I gave you an Lucy you are the one and I was really fascinated about that right the ways in which like because it felt like a re-traumatization in many instances, right? We know that Lucy already has experienced this kind of violence and now in an unexpected way, she experiences a different kind of violence, right? And although we want to believe that the violence is kind of like humane in some ways because this person tries to feed her, says, oh no, wear clothing, must eat something. It's still violent, right? Because ultimately, yeah. There's a tragic end that happens, not for Lucy, but for, for, for the copycat, but as a result of like, just like, what the hell, right? And I was so interested about that to, to think about, it felt like in many ways, Lucy had stepped out of kind of running towards danger. And just as she thought she was a little bit comfortable, danger came. But isn't it, isn't life like that? That <laughs> if, if you already staring danger will follow you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, again, subconsciously, she she did, you, you know, if you if you recall in the aftermath of that encounter, because the setting and the event that is involved is of such national importance, you know, she she is challenged by one of her colleagues, Uguti, like, I mean, you've got to do something. There's this capability, you know, on 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 the side of their partners, their business partners, there's capabilities in terms of her safety and how her safety was compromised. And being a typical Lucy, she kind of thinks thinks about, oh, you know, but but maybe they will say that I brought this on to myself, you know, by reaching out to these because she was she was writing a book about book. yeah about this I think she's preoccupied with the things that I'm preoccupied about. She's preoccupied about trauma. She's preoccupied about the violence. She's truly obsessed with the idea that it can't the way that our society currently operates like is not normal. Like that's what keeps her up at night is that it can't be normal that we have this level of violent crime. So I think even after, even after everything that she's gone through, even after what happens at the end of the Read Nance Docker, she will still find like a question that she would want to answer. And mm -hmm. she will still go out there to try and answer that question. And all her questions have to do with the same thing. Sure. And maybe that's and a good normal. This is not normal. This is not the way. I mean, there's societies where there's like a 2% crime rate, 2% sure. of Sweden, you know, you know, they've got, they're closing prisons. They've got, I, I think it's the Netherlands, it's it's Sweden. They close, there's prisons that just sit there because nobody's committing crimes. So mm -hmm. basically her preoccupation is if there's people like that, if there's people that can live like that, why can't we be that kind of society? 
So I don't think she'll ever stop him. Now I want to talk about the hunter since we're speaking about Lucy's preoccupations. The hunter is just such an interesting, like, what's going on? You know, what is it about him? And the hunter is an interesting that you've got a crush. You know, there's women who are telling me they've got a crush on the hunter. And no, she, why? Why? And that is like, weird. we've got an unhealthy preoccupation as a country. Like, why would you read the hunter, see the Burvo scene, and then when uh, you you have a crush on that person? Like, you what what about that says that that's the kind of person that you should be crushing on? What's about his dimasaku? Hmm? For him to solve the problems and come back and you know victorious. So okay, so what do you want? What, what do you want to ask me about the hunter? But I mean, I think my curiosity is about the hunter as a character, right? Because we see a lot of male inflicted violence in this book, right? Which is interesting. Like men, men are the ones who are typically inflicting violence on each other in this book right but in very calculating and very insidious ways so the hunter has a, a moral point in some ways but he crosses the line there's a very clear line that he crosses right in the book that also then makes it hard that makes you as a reader almost sympathize almost not quite almost sympathize with the person he's hunting in the book and i found that moral conflict interesting right because i thought Initially, you're like, yes, you know, we think about vigilantism, we think about people, people getting their lick, but there is a moral conflict that the hunter arises even in you as a reader, no matter how much you think that the person that he's inflicting the violence on deserves it. And I want to talk about writing that moral conflict and why you wrote the hunter in the way that you did. Yeah, the hunter was a very interesting decision for me because he he is the opposite of what our of how justice is meted out in South Africa at the moment, and he's an interesting kind of paradigm in the sense that he's kind of like like you're saying he's kind of like the the so so now one of the big like hot button issues about about justice in South Africa is firstly, it is delayed most of the time and it is denied a lot of the time. And so as a society, when you're feeling that helpless, you know, if you actually look at the characters, you look at Lucy's character and what ends up happening and how, you know, the meeting out of justice in, in her scenario works out at the end of the book, how, Zugiswa, the young girl from Swaziland, the rebel, the, you know, like how, how she meets out justice, how she decides to meet out justice because of the same kind of sense of helplessness that a lot of us, a lot of us feel, right? So they are at one end of the spectrum, right? And then you have a Morabedi who is in uniform. He's supposed to be the carrier of that justice for us, for us as society. It's the likes of Morabedi, the likes of the cops in Swaziland, the director of, you know, the Royal Police there in Swaziland, all of those people. Legally, they are kind of the first port of call when we are, we as citizens are in dire straits. But then the government decides to do an interesting thing because they're not supposed to deploy like an army operative to deal with a matter, like a criminal matter, um, that is concerned in the book without, you know, like just revealing everything. So that criminal matter is supposed to be a policing matter. But the Minister of Justice makes this interesting decision, it's a covert decision, you know, to leave this to the army and to get the army to get the, the special ops guys involved. But then special ops guys, if you've met them, <laughs> if you've ever met somebody who works in the special operations division of the army, <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying all of them are extreme characters, for lack of a better word, but I mean, they are, it does take a special kind of individual to qualify for that division. You know, you really have to be somebody who's willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to, to get the job done. So I'm not talking about a normal SNDF soldier, I'm talking about special ops. And so, so this character, he's kind of a sociopath. In fact, he's not kind of, he's a sociopath. And, and he has a lot of sociopathic tendencies that, you know, right from the moment that we encounter him as readers, they are clearly laid out. Doesn't have time to be 
having relationships, romance, attachments, all of that. It's just not who he is. And so we know that we've got a formidable. hmm? He's about the job. He's just like, I got to He's about the job. I got to And he'll get it done. He'll get it if he has to kill, if he has to maim, if he has to, he will get the job done. So he's quite a formidable opponent for our fugitive, right? But I think in a lot of ways, it's interesting when you think about how mob justice works in South Africa, because, you know, there's a recent case uh, in Tembisa where I think three, sorry if I'm, I don't have like the exact, you know, facts of, 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 of the case, but basically I think three people were accused of gross criminality. The, society, the community was tired and certain members of the community decided to take the law into their own hands and they brutalized these people they killed these people and now nobody's willing to talk about who these people are the people that carried out this justice so in a lot of ways that's how i see the hunter the hunt is that part of justice that is you know on the fringes (laughs) he's not like the legitimate way of doing things as much as he's part of the SNDF. He's kind of a rogue element. And I think it was just interesting to weigh the options of how you deal with somebody like, like a serial killer that is on the loose, that has been getting away with murder for years, that will continue to torture, murder, kill. So I think it was just posing that social issue, like the social question, Wuti. What does it take? And if the cops are not going to do their job, what is morally justifiable? Those are the moral questions. What is just if if, if the cops are not going to do it, if the Ministry of Justice or the, the security clusters and the powers that be are not going to bring these criminals to book, what does it take? And what what are we as society willing to agree to as measures of fighting back. I just want to say I love the ending. The ending is my girl. <laughs> the ending is my girl. And I don't know it's what satisfying. The... At I last think... I have a satisfying ending. My my endings are really satisfying. I know which I tend to mess up the reader <laughs> and just make you angry and make you frustrated. So please guys once and I don't even know ending, what that says about me, right? I don't know what that says about me. Don't like, no 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 power. No power. <laughs> power. Don't tell me. Don't tell me you're not happy about the girl power. No, that was my favorite ending of, of the books. Like, <laughs> that ending gave me life. It was it was restorative. So for me, it's interesting. Oh, finally. <laughs> I can rest in peace. <laughs> for me, it's interesting. Uh, uh, not rest in peace, Angelo. Those two are so not rest in peace. You can just no, wait. I, that's a point. I, you know, I'm still around. You can just wait it. until your next book. Thanks. Um, until my next book. Relax, relax, relax. You know, it's so strange, guys, being a, a creative. Two nights ago, like, I had a dream where, I don't know if it was my brother or somebody very close to me, was giving me, like, the most brilliant, brilliant, brilliant plot for a crime thriller. And like, they mapped it out for me. Like, what is the plot? Who are the characters? Kind of the inciting moment, like the inciting incident for for everything that's gonna fall apart. Like literally I had like a whole plot structure in the stream. And I woke up and I was like, this is so brilliant. This is so brilliant. I wanna write it down so that I don't forget it. And then now I can't sleep because I'm like, I'm like, drawing on 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 the story and I, I'm, I'm 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 drawing out the narrative and i'm adding things and i'm like yes yes, yes and this is gonna happen and this is and then i couldn't sleep and and okay so i tried to go back to sleep and the next morning i took out my notes on my phone i started scribbling so i i'm still around don't worry <laughs> don't worry around <laughs> long story short <laughs> for me it's interesting the ending does i think a number of things that you were saying right because similar to the hunter the ending is also about this kind of moral question right 
because the question is, what does justice really look like to people, right? When we think about it in a legal sense, right, does justice look like what happened to Napoleon where he had gone into prison? Or does justice look like what it did for these people who were like, finally, we have our time because our friends were maimed, were killed. Now it's our time, right? So for me, I thought it was quite interesting to think about like kind of this affirmation of agency because it feels like in the way that serial killer works and in the way of violence, a lot of the power and the agency is taken away from victims. And this felt effectively like a reclamation of that. Like just like the fact that like, yeah, we are even in this brief moment have some power to take care of our own, right? And that's what I wanted to talk about. Like this just idea of like the taking of power throughout the stories, right? Both in Red Ink and in the Reed Dance Stalker, and then the ending kind of being a reclaiming of that power. Even I think in many instances for Lucy. Yeah, I mean, and I think what was beautiful for me was that, you know, I mean, if you think about a maiden, think about a virgin, a maiden in a cultural, in a very misogynistic and paternalistic um, setting or culture. I mean, that's kind of like the weakest, like that's the weakest link. That's the weakest person. That's the person who can't even, in some instances, control who they marry. That's somebody who can decide whether they want to work or not. Like that is literally the one person that has no agency, whether we say we respect culture or not, but just being placed in that kind of world, in, in that kind of setting, it does it does take away your agency. And, and sometimes it's not something that maybe you're not aware because this is the this is the world you know, like this is this is your culture, this is all you know. And so, you know, taking that vulnerability of somebody who, even the way that you present yourself, like at the at the read dance, is like, you know, you're not fully covered. Your body is very much exposed. And so, like, how are, who are you gonna fight? When are you, you gonna fight a serial killer when are your whole your self and she met him, <laughs> mademoiselle, you know, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. And so that's what was exciting to me about, about setting this, this book, uh, that misogynistic culture. And so, yes, I can understand. And I, of course, as a writer and as a woman, it was very fulfilling to have that type of ending because also it goes back to the fact that when the structures that are set up by these evolved societies that we live in now, you know, if you've got democracy, if you've got, well, even if it's not a full <laughs> democracy, but if you've got very clear structures, courts, cops, you know, investigation, all of these fancy things that are supposed to make you feel protected if things go wrong in your life and you find they're not really doing anything for you. you. In the end, you only have yourself to rely on. So what do you do? And that's what the girls do, you know? And I think it's a reality. It's a reality for, for most women, like I said, like for most vulnerable people. In the end, you have to rely on yourself because the system most of the time is going to let you down. So I think that is kind of, that's drawing the line in the sand, Uti. Guys, come on, you know. <laughs> At some point, you you really have to to take charge and exercise that agency. And I'm not saying we have to be vigilantes. I'm just saying there are tools that we have. Yeah, that is very important. <laughs> but I think you make an important points around just. You know, we often feel like we don't have agency. And I think that the beautiful thing about that ending was feeling like in some ways we can take control, right? Like, yeah, these things that happen to us, but they are, there is some agency that we have. There are things that we can do. And that was beautiful, right? That that feeling like, okay, we can, we can, we can do this. And so I think just from the Cheeky Natives, thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening conversation. I think... I harassed you about a sequel to Red Ink for years. And, and you're, you're actually one of those voices that stuck to my head. Like, Angela, when are you writing the sequel? No, you can't just leave it like that. I spoke to my mom and my mom says, no, you can't just leave it like that. Like, no. And people, like, hey, I'm like, 
many oh, generations of women. Talk about a cheeky native. <laughs> but honestly, my mom and I wanted to know what happened. Imagine leaving generations of women just were you gonna I wait for my mother? Mother? I hope I hope you've given your mom a copy of the Redan Stalker because it would be really unfair after all that pressure, Alma. Really, honestly, don't don't <laughs> worry about me, sweetheart. Don't worry about her. She writes it now. We are we are sorted. But but yeah. So I think you, you know have to have shared shared not my copy because you know I don't give my copies of books away. But I got her a copy. No copy, but like you gifted her or she bought it for herself. But she I gifted she has to her. Have I had to gift her. I I gave her red ink. I could I set myself up. So as a result, yeah. I had to also you, gift you her. Follow through. Yeah, you had to. Yeah, to, to but I mean, through. I think. You know, because I, I had such a strong relationship with Red Ink, I'm really grateful that you wrote the Red Dawn Stalker because I think now I can rest, you know, emotionally, spiritually, I feel that I can rest when it comes to Your so PTSD it has been resolved. Yes, it has. <laughs> now I'm like, Lucy, Lucy's okay because I have to stress about Lucy, right? I'm like, yo, go You had therapy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, I think that speaks to, like, just the power of your writing and it speaks to how important it is to see our in stories but also to write to write stories that span generations i mean the fact that both my mother and i was so stressed about red ink and the sequel speaks to that right and it speaks to the power of your writing so from the cheek natives congratulations seeing all these adaptations of your work feels like it feels so so much like a light right and, and i think it's beautiful that there are young women who look like you who are writing books and realizing that there is a market for people to read their work but not only that people want to read their work that the work translates across different mediums so congratulations we are super excited from the cheeky natives and thank you so much for joining us for today's podcast we have lots of feelings and i feel like in some way you've gone on to resolve some of some of my feelings yeah, no, I could see you guys were catching feelings. Yo, <laughs> it was a fiery discussion. I was actually scared a little bit. I'm like, hey, if people, <laughs> but it was really, thank you so much, Angela. As you can see, <laughs> really enjoyed the sequel, and we will definitely be staying tuned to Show Max to continue watching and also being kind of surprised by red ink and some of the things that were in the book that kind of plays differently out in the story. So thank you very much. The Read Dawn Stalker obviously is available. And let me tell you something, Cheeky Natures, this is a promise that I make myself. If you buy from us, I will make sure that it's personally signed by the author of uh, the Read Dawn Stalker. Angela, thank you. Because this is my buddy here. Yes. And so, so thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. I always enjoy conversations with the Cheeky Natives. And I hope, yes, you do tune in to Red Ink Show Max every Tuesday. Uh, two episodes have already uh, been loaded onto the platform. Um, watch it, enjoy it, discuss it, discuss it, talk about it on Twitter, tweet about it. Let's have conversations, real conversations, proper conversations. Thank you. Thank you.